Tonight, a gunman kills several people and injures others at a place of worship in Germany. The latest on a rare and shocking incident. In a testy hearing in Ottawa, a federal minister says Canada's been tough on China. I looked at him in the eyes and said to him, first, we will never tolerate any form of foreign interference. I'm sure he was very intimidated. Pro-democracy protests across Israel against the government's plan to reduce the power of the judiciary. Women, gay, community, Arabs, everybody. The only one who protects them is the Supreme Court. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. We begin with breaking news from Hamburg, Germany tonight. There's been a mass shooting, something that doesn't happen often in that country. This one was inside a place of worship. The details are still coming in, but at least six people are believed dead, at least seven wounded. It happened at a Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall in Germany's second largest city. Here's Ithil Musa with what we know right now. This was the scene outside a building in Hamburg. Inside, police say multiple people were shot, some fatally. I saw seriously injured people, says this man, dead people wrapped up in bags. It was very hard to see, he added. It all happened just after 9 p.m. local time in a Jehovah's Witness meeting hall a few kilometers north of the city's downtown. Hamburg police say when officers arrived, they found people with gunshot wounds on the ground floor. They also heard a shot coming from an upper floor. When they investigated, they discovered a person fatally wounded. Police say there are no indications that the perpetrator or perpetrators fled. And offering his sympathy to the families of the victims, Hamburg's mayor tweeted the news of the incident was shocking. Shocking in part because mass shootings are rare in Germany. This appears to be the deadliest since two incidents in early 2020. Police say the motive is not known. They are appealing to the public not to share assumptions or spread rumors. Ivo Musa, CBC News, Toronto. To Ukraine now, where a Russian missile attack has again brought a wave of death, terror and exhaustion. Those missiles hit targets throughout the country, killing at least six civilians. Lindsay Duncombe shows us what makes this attack especially rare and dangerous. The largest wave of Russian missile strikes on Ukraine so far this year hit while people slept. A family killed in this village in western Ukraine, buried in rubble. We were hoping that they're alive, she says, but they're not alive. A swarm of missiles, 81 in total and several drones, hit 10 regions across the country. Ukraine says it intercepted close to half of them. In Kherson, local authorities say two people died when artillery hit this public transit stop. Another woman killed by shrapnel. Russia's main targets, though, infrastructure and electricity. The attacks initially left 40 percent of the capital in the dark. I'm fed up with it. Can't stand all this. I don't have the strength anymore. Why are they doing this? That exhaustion of the Ukrainian public, the military and Western allies may be exactly what Russia is trying to provoke, according to this military analyst. I think Russia has prepared for a very long war. And Russia understands that Western countries are not going to back down. Ukraine counted six hypersonic cruise missiles, which it can't intercept, believed to be the largest number fired by Russia in the war to date. In southern Ukraine, the Russian-controlled Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the largest in Europe, lost power for the sixth time, prompting this plea from the UN's nuclear watchdog. Each time we are rolling a dice, and if we allow this to continue, Time after time, then one day our luck will run out. He urged the parties to agree to a protection zone around the plant. But in this bleak aftermath, there is no sign the sides are closer to an agreement on that or peace. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, London. 
Here at home tonight, Ella Morrow has the reaction to last night's CBC News exclusive. Retired Canadian Olympians pushing for a competition ban on Russian and Belarusian athletes. For Ukrainian athletes, there's no room for ambiguity. And they say the stance of Canadian Olympic officials falls flat and falls short. Ukrainian Olympian Vladislav Kriskevich has fiercely protested the invasion of his country. The situation is the same as it was a year ago. The same war, like a lot of people being killed by, by Russian occupiers. Now he's outraged that Canada's Olympic Committee is open to a path for Russians to participate in the 2024 Games. So you just put yourself in, on our place. Dozens of former Canadian Olympians have signed a letter, first reported on The National, demanding the COC take a stronger stance against the possibility of Russian athletes competing under a neutral banner at the Paris Olympics. You have to have moral courage and you have to do what's right. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're asking our governing body to do. The COC is downplaying the dispute, asserting in response, we support the exclusion of Russian and Belarusian athletes while the invasion is ongoing. But the COC is also leaving room for Russian participation under a workable neutrality model. The government's position is clear. Canada's sport minister says neutrality is impossible. The models that were proposed previously by the IOC in regards to neutrality, whether it was because of uh, drug use by Russian athletes, has never worked. So we don't see how they can have a better proposal. The International Olympic Committee initially said Russian athletes should be banned. Then it backtracked, signaling openness to a so-called pathway for their participation. Critics say it's part of a pattern, the IOC kowtowing to Moscow. As far as the IOC concerns, they just want to expand their reach as far as possible, seemingly unconcerned about their, the broader consequences of the Olympic Games in geopolitics and the ways that the Olympics are used as a tool of these authoritarian regimes. Other national Olympic committees have pushed back against the IOC. Of course, it's a big disaster. Herskevich wants Canada's to do the same. Listen to your athletes, listen to their voices and make right decisions. Ellen, in your item, uh, you mentioned other countries. What is the position they're now taking on Russia? Well, Nordic countries have been really strong on this. The Olympic committees of Norway, Sweden, Finland, uh, Iceland, Denmark have all come out and said, now is not the time to be considering Russian participation at all in 2024. The Latvian Olympic Committee has threatened to boycott the Paris Games if Russians are allowed to participate. Now, we've tried to get more clarity on the COC position, that sort of wiggle room that's been left but no one was available last night. And when we reached out again today, we didn't get a response. To an interview. Exactly. All right. El Moro, thank you. You're welcome. The Canadian women's soccer team took their demand for equal pay right to Parliament Hill today. As Thomas Dagla shows us, Canada soccer seemed to have noticed. Accustomed to doing battle on the field, the players were called to Ottawa to discuss a different kind of fight. Our most painstaking battle has been with our own federation. Led by Captain Christine Sinclair, four members of the Olympic gold medal winning women's soccer team laid out for a Commons committee what they consider unfair treatment from the sports federation. The disparity between the treatment of the men's and women's national teams is glaring and it shows that Canada soccer views the women's program to be of secondary importance to the men's program. Wearing purple on the pitch to demand equity, players are also asking Canada Soccer to open its books and explain how the Federation makes and spends money. During contract talks last year, Sinclair says then-president Nick Bontis used sexist language to trivialize their demands. The president of Canada Soccer listened to what I had to say and then later in the meeting referred back to it as, quote, what was it Christine was bitching about? Just before the hearing, the Federation laid out in public its offer to the women and men, saying the proposed collective bargaining agreements will pay both national teams the same amount for playing a 90-minute match. We feel quite disrespected. There were terms and numbers and pieces of what was in their statement today that has not even been communicated to us. See the young fan in the red jersey shaking her head in disbelief? The players say they're doing this for girls like her, making the sport more fair for generations to come. 
Canada soccer executives are being called to testify later this month. And not only that, the players are saying it may be time for a public inquiry to examine the culture across several sports. Thomas Dagg, Le CBC News, Toronto. In a different committee room in Ottawa, the government tried to show it's been vigilant on the issue of China's attempts to interfere in federal elections. Ashley Burke shows us what the minister said during a rough and tumble exchange. Under pressure to show the government is taking China's meddling seriously, the foreign affairs minister confirmed a case where it blocked Beijing. When China wanted to send a political operative last fall, uh, we decided to deny a visa, which obviously is the right thing to do. China said the visa was for a new diplomatic job at its Canadian embassy, but a source confirmed to CBC News, Ottawa concluded it was for a suspected operative. We are always uh, watching very carefully to make sure uh, that people coming to Canada, even diplomats, uh, are you know, following the rules and are coming for uh, the stated purposes. One visa denied, not a single diplomat uh, expelled. Hardly the actions of a government that takes Beijing's interference seriously. If we have any form of clear evidence of any wrongdoing, we will send, we will send diplomats packing very, very, very quickly. But doing that, she said, would have repercussions for Canada. For any expulsion, there is an expulsion afterwards for, uh, uh, of us in China. Jolie revealed officials did call in China's ambassador two weeks ago. On election interference? Yes or Inc no? Like, yes. like I said, yes. And she said she raised the issue last week with her Chinese counterpart. I looked at him in the eyes and said to him, first, we will never tolerate any form of foreign interference. Uh, you've talked tough with your uh, Beijing counterpart, so you say uh, you even stared into his eyes. I'm sure he was very intimidated. I won't comment on your question and particularly the beginning because I think it's actually... Oh, you, you, madam, you madam, know, the tone. madam. The bickering on China's interference spilled over to the House of Commons. He allowed this, knowingly allowed this to go ahead in two successive elections and now he's delaying. It's a bit rich for the former Minister of Democratic Institutions who did nothing to counter foreign interference. Okay, Ashley, another one of those very heated days on Parliament Hill. Meanwhile, it seems the RCMP has now confirmed it's opened another investigation linked to China. What do we know about that one? Yeah, Adrian, that's right. The Mounties are investigating two more alleged covert police stations that they believe are operating on behalf of Beijing's government, these ones in Quebec. Now, police were already investigating a handful of similar police stations in Ontario and B.C. and shut some down. One human rights group says that these centers have been used to pressure some Chinese nationals to return to China, and that's raising fears, including for activists who have been critical of Beijing. All right, Ashley Burke in Ottawa, thank you. At issue is going to have a lot more to say on this topic. Rosie is away. Ian is moderating tonight. That is just ahead on The National. Well, it's confirmed U.S. President Joe Biden will address Parliament during an official visit later this month, his first trip to Canada since taking office. Biden's speech is expected to be the highlight of a two-day visit starting March 23rd. Time has also been carved out for a private sit-down with the Prime Minister. And more reaction tonight to yesterday's grilling of Canada's big supermarket CEOs by MPs. The grocers say their profits are not responsible for the soaring cost of food. Well, since then, CBC News has been flooded with questions about what is behind the surge. So we asked Peter Armstrong to look into it. It's easy to find Canadians upset about food prices. They're ripping us off like they're ripping you off. I feel like they're all in cahoots. It's easy to find a grocery chain CEO who says it's not their fault. The idea that grocers are causing food inflation is not only false, it's impossible. What is hard is to untangle a complex business model and get to the bottom of what and who is driving up food prices. We at Empire are not profiting from inflation. It doesn't matter how many times you say it, write it or tweet it. It is simply not true. But that's not entirely true either. There's no question that grocery chains are benefiting from inflation. On a customer's $25 grocery basket, we earn just $1 in profit. 
That $1 is a 4% margin. Consider a grocer that sells $1 million in groceries. A 4% profit margin would net them $40,000. If prices went up and they sold $2 million worth of groceries, that same 4% cut is suddenly $80,000. Profits are rising because that same percentage brings in more money. The real question, though, is whether grocery chains are taking advantage of inflation to drive up prices by more than they need to, which is complex. Loblaw's earnings are mixed in with everything else the parent company owns, and it doesn't release specific price pressures. This economist says that's just a distraction. Canadians are paying more than just the cost of production, and these companies are making excess profits as a result. There's one easy remedy here. The grocery chains could release more granular data and show they're simply passing along the increased costs they're facing. But they've never done that before and won't likely now. Meanwhile, they're hardly the only ones seeing record profits. Stanford says Canadian energy companies have seen their profits soar by more than 1,000% in the past three years alone. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. So if you want to see how far your grocery dollar is actually going or not going, check out our interactive inflation ca calculator where you can track food prices month to month. Just go to cbc.ca slash inflation calculator. Officials in Louisville, Kentucky are promising change tonight after the release of a damning report into the high-profile police killing of Breonna Taylor. The United States Department of Justice essentially said yes. We have heard you, we heard your complaints, and you were right. The report is very troubling. Um, and, and there's actions in those in the report that we must address and we will address. The two-year probe found that Louisville police engaged in a pattern of civil rights violations, including the routine use of excessive force, conducting searches based on invalid warrants and unlawful discrimination against black people. Taylor, a black hospital worker, was shot dead by Louisville police in her own home during a botched raid in March of 2020. U.S. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell is being treated in hospital for a concussion. The 81-year-old tripped last night during a dinner at a Washington hotel. In 2019, McConnell fractured his shoulder when he fell in his home in Kentucky. Tensions are high in Israel tonight after mass anti-government protests and an attack claimed by the militant group Hamas. Demonstrators want the government to drop controversial plans to curb the power of the Supreme Court. Chris Brown shows us the dramatic day. In Israel, this is what protesters say resisting dictatorship looks like. In Tel Aviv, thousands tried to block a major highway and clashed with police. Others blocked the country's main airport as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu tried to catch a flight. And in Jerusalem, students and university professors banged on drums and chanted, democracy. Trying to overthrow our judiciary is, is unknown territory and very, very frightening. It's just very troubling to see um, how quickly things are turning into this turnkey dictatorship. What's at stake for people here are changes to the country's Supreme Court that they say will diminish its power and allow the governing party to override decisions that it does not agree with. Remarkably, among the protest leaders are military reservists meant to be apolitical. But this general says he and others cannot stay quiet. The only one who is defending democracy, women, gay, community, Arabs, everybody, the only one who protects them is the Supreme Court. He says for him, this fight has become intensely personal. We have a prime minister who is totally sick. He has people next to him who are all fascists. He's talking about Itamar Ben-Gavir and others from the far right. They've advocated demolishing Palestinian homes, emboldening Israeli settlers who recently rampaged through the Palestinian community of Hawara after the shooting death of two Israelis. But Netanyahu said again, the court changes will proceed. We won't let anyone cancel the decision of the majority, he said. This observer says with business and investment also pulling out of Israel, the pressure is rising, but not enough. He listens to foreign pressure, but right now that isn't what's moving him because there isn't enough foreign pressure. 
Israel's rightward lurch has sent violence with the Palestinians surging. 70 Palestinian militants and civilians have been killed since the start of the year, and 11 Israelis are also dead. In Tel Aviv Thursday night, a shooting left three people injured in what police quickly labeled another terror attack. Chris Brown, CBC News, Jerusalem. Canada's largest school board is taking an unprecedented step to stop bullying based on caste. So many of us Dalits have, have been fearful to speak out of who we are. Why many in Toronto's South Asian community are applauding. Fans are remembering the man who charmed in an iconic walk. A fiddler on the roof. And a baby calf with a pretty rough start and a lot of grit. This guy's got the will to want to live and keep on going, so if we named him Will. We are back in two. That's terrifying. A pair of Vancouver window washers got caught in a pretty tough spot today. Their platform got stuck, so rescue crews had to rappel down to meet them. Now, that Rubik's Cube-shaped building made it a bit of a challenge. Luckily, after about an hour, everyone was safe. No injuries reported. Now to a first for Canada. Toronto's school board has voted to acknowledge that oppression exists in its system that's rooted in India's history. Lisa Shing shows us some are welcoming this in the South Asian community, others are not. And that has passed 16 to 5. A motion passed and a victory for many in Toronto's South Asian community. I think we made history. I'm so honoured. The trustee sponsored a motion to have Canada's largest school board recognize caste oppression exists in schools and to work with the province's Human Rights Commission on how to deal with incidents. It's happening from students to students. It's happening from teacher to students and teacher to teacher. The caste system is an ancient form of social hierarchy in India that spread to the diaspora. Historically, dominant castes have enjoyed greater rights. Oppressed castes, like Dalits, deal with social ostracization, even violence. Raja Kulasingham says she has heard from hundreds of families about harassment and bullying based on caste. They've come here as immigrants. Mira Solanki Estrada says she's faced that all her life. She's like, I wouldn't want a stupid kid, and my eyes filled with tears. She says the motion will protect her two children. So many of us Dalits have been fearful to speak out of who we are. I didn't say who I was until I, I was 40 years old. In February, Seattle became the first U.S. city to ban discrimination based on caste. It's now a protected class alongside race, religion and gender identity. Despite these developments, there has been vocal opposition. That singles out the South Asian community. Where is the data? More rigorous analysis needs to be done. But some say it's time to call out what's happening in the community. South Asians make up about a fifth of all students in Toronto's public board. Who should tell that caste doesn't exist? It is the victims of the caste system who should tell whether they are being treated fair and equal or not. With this motion, some hope more stories will emerge. Lisa Sheng, CBC News, Toronto. The world-famous Israeli actor Haim Topol has died at 87 after playing his signature role more than 3,500 times. If I were a rich man, Canadian director Norman Jewison cast him as Tevye the Milkman in the hit 1971 film Fiddler on the Roof. Topol also played the role on the London stage and in Broadway revivals. At first, obviously, he needed very heavy makeup. Not so much when he played the role last in 2009. After the break, look who it is. Ian's here with that issue. Hey, Ian. Hi, Adrian. Hey, uh, filling in for Rosie this week. We're going to talk about the latest news regarding election interference. Canadians know that foreign interference is not and should never be a partisan issue. That's why we'll be appointing an independent expert to identify any gaps in our system. What this push for an independent investigation could mean for the federal government, Chantal, Althea and Andrew join me to talk about that and more.
Hi, I'm Ian Hanamansing filling in for Rosie. Here's what's at issue this week. The federal government is facing increased political pressure and new questions around its response to election meddling attempts by China. On what date will the Prime Minister bring in a foreign influence registry? Has CSIS warned the Prime Minister, his staff, members of his party, uh, that members of his caucus or cabinet are part of a foreign interference network, yes or no? Why does the Prime Minister just launch a public inquiry and answer all those questions and give confidence to Canadians in our democracy? Those questions come just days after the Prime Minister promised to appoint a special rapporteur on election interference. Canadians know that foreign interference is not and should never be a partisan issue. That's why we'll be appointing an independent expert to identify any gaps in our system. So what should we make of the government's response and what are the political consequences? Let's bring in our panelists, Chantal Hébert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj. And Andrew, I'll start with you. You wrote in the Globe and Mail that Wednesday was a gruesome day for the Prime Minister, given the, the latest reporting on the China interference story. Uh, is the Prime Minister doing the right thing by calling for a rapporteur instead of an inquiry? Well, he, he could do a lot more before that. I mean, it was a gruesome day, not only because of the report that came out that fleshed out uh, this reporting that we've seen earlier about what he was told, what people in his office were told about uh, Chinese interference uh, in ways that are pretty hard to dismiss as just simply a, a rogue CSIS operative. I mean, it was his own National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians, to use that long term, uh, that was reporting this. And like all the other reports he seems to receive from that committee, he ignored them. But it was how he responded or, in fact, didn't respond to it. He was facing... A, a series of questions from the media, which he simply refused to answer. He was then asked a series of basically factual questions in Parliament by Pierre Poilievre, who had a much better day than he had previously. He, went, he came out way too hot, you know, in the, the, a couple of days ago, basically accusing the Prime Minister of treason, but simply asking him a series of factual questions which the Prime Minister manifestly and obviously uh, failed to refuse to answer. It just made him look really bad. So, you know, the only reason we need an inquiry is to get him to answer these questions, but he could avoid the inquiry. He doesn't have to call a rapporteur. He doesn't have to do any of this stuff, really, but just sit down and answer questions. He could hold a press conference tomorrow. He could go in front of the committee and answer questions. So he's making this to look like, he's trying to make this look like it's this really complicated, deep, dark secrets that are involved here, when in fact the basics of this, of what did the Prime Minister know and when did he know it, are pretty simple and are absolutely within his power to answer. Chantel, how damaging has this topic become for the Liberals? That uh, is frankly hard to tell, and I'm not so sure that it's the most important uh, question at this point. The Liberals probably think it is, and the sense you get from them is that they think this will all blow over uh, and people will move on. They probably get that sense from the fact that uh, Aaron O'Toole went hard at the Liberals over China issues for as long as he was leader and it uh, didn't pay off in terms of votes. It never really had a lot of traction. But uh, to go back to Andrew's point, if people assumed, uh, and rightly on Monday, that they were witnessing a course correction when the prime minister announced all these steps, whatever you may have thought of them, the rest of the week kind of completely defeated what happened on Monday. It was just evasions after evasions, uh, filibuster in a committee. Uh, and I'm with Andrew on this. There are answers. They can't be that hard to give. They don't involve national security. They could be given within the purview of a parliamentary committee. And if the government wants to convince Canadians that it has something to hide over the past two weeks, it has probably convinced more Canadians of that fact than the alternative. All right, Althea, weigh in on this. Um, well, I agree with that. I mean, I think the issue has been mismanaged from the beginning in terms of the prime minister, first of all, trying to sweep the issue under the rug. There's nothing to see here, folks. And then refusing to answer very clear questions. And I agree with Andrew and Chantal that most of the questions he probably has answers to. And in fact, most of the... <sighs> Most of the illuminating responses we've had on this um, have actually come from committee. Uh, on Thursday morning, we had Dominic LeBlanc, uh, the Intergovernmental Affairs Minister, tell us that actually one of the reasons why the Liberals decided to go with the special rapporteur is because 
They felt that if they were going to announce a public inquiry, the opposition would criticize them on the terms of the inquiry. Um, and I don't think they're wrong about that. I'm not sure that there was a win-win there. Um, but we don't have answers. I feel like the Conservatives, I think to Andrew's earlier point, have come out too hot to the point where they're name-calling, insinuating that the Prime Minister is not loyal to Canada, that he's been in uh, the pocket of China for the last decade, confusing issues that, you know, like the Trudeau Foundation has nothing to do with the Prime Minister. Um, and 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 using theater to get to the to answers which kind of trivializes the whole thing but if the prime minister wanted to help clear the air he absolutely could go to a parliamentary committee instead of having liberals filibuster to prevent his chief of staff from testifying the prime minister should say hey ministerial accountability i'm willing to go testify in her place ask me all the questions you want and the ones that i can't answer the ones that i can answer i will so, Althea, given the, the allegations and really what appears to be evidence of Chinese meddling uh, in, in the Canadian political process, and as you say, the, the allegations made by the Conservatives, too hot or not, but, you know, do you think this is having sort of a damaging impact on the part of Canadians just in terms of trust in, in our democracy? Absolutely. I mean, I think I think back on the Maharar stuff, the leaks in those cases were eventually found to be completely unsubstantiated. We don't know the quality. I don't know. I'm not privy to these leaks. I have not seen any of the documents that the Globe and Mail is reporting on or Global. So I don't really know what to make of them. But I think an impression is left here that there's something incredibly nefarious happening that is causing people to distress our electoral process. There are already people who are... I don't know how to say this politely, but who have started to believe conspiracy theories since the pandemic, who have excuses to believe more conspiracy theories. And we really do need to do something to calm the air. I know Abacus Data um, pollster David Coletto has some uh, numbers coming out tomorrow that basically show as many conservative as liberals want to see a public inquiry because I think people want to see the air cleared. Andrew, you said the prime minister could just simply answer a lot of these questions in a news conference. You know, given where we're at tonight, what should he do next? He, he's, well, it, it, he should answer those questions. I don't think he will. And I think one is entitled to draw some inferences about his refusal to answer simple questions. You know, either his party has received uh, illegal cash donations from the Chinese government indirectly via, via intermediaries, or it hasn't. If it hasn't, where's the harm in saying so? Uh, either he was told that the uh, Chinese government was essentially handpicking candidates, uh, or he was not told that. He can, again, he can confirm or deny that. We're not even getting denials, basically, from this, except a very narrow technical denial, of, you know, carefully worded, often repeated about, I did not have information on cash going to candidates, uh, which is, you know, directly from China, which is not necessarily what's been alleged. So it, it, it is within his power to clear it up. I think it is, it, it, um, you know, there's a kind of reverse conspiracy theory where you're presented with compelling testimony that something is up here, whether you, you, you don't want to go off and convict anybody on this, but that there are serious questions to be answered. And I don't think we can just wave that away and say, oh, well, who can, who can say it's all just hearsay? This is coming from multiple sources. This is not just raw data. This is stuff that's been assessed in the, in the uh, Privy Council office, in the, in the NSI COP committee. This is not raw intelligence anymore. This is, this is things that were, that were given great deal of consideration and passed on to the Prime Minister's office, and nothing apparently happened after that. Chantelle on the... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, I think some liberal strategists probably thought it was clever to say we we're going to have a special rapporteur to deal with all this, which might have been clever two weeks ago. But to be clever on Monday, it should have been uh, announced with a name on the job. Mm -hmm. uh, absent that name, I think the liberals are about to discover that they're they're going to be digging themselves in rather than clearing the air in the sense that uh, after this week, how many eminent Canadians really want to accept that brief uh, that Justin Trudeau wants to hand to someone? Uh, and how many will want to sacrifice credibility capital by finding a way to explain that there shouldn't be a public inquiry while the momentum behind that idea has continued to gather uh, steam to go back to your first question about impact, I don't know if it will change votes, but I do know that it's undermining liberal morale 
in caucus mm -hmm. and within the ranks of the Liberal Party. We will be back with another round of that issue. Right now, what I'm more concerned about is the vile and racist views of the Prime Minister. On the offensive, Pierre Polyev is pushing back on questions about his MPs by pointing to Trudeau's past. We'll talk about that strategy next on The National. Welcome to another round of Ad Issue. This week, the leader of the official opposition said the three Conservative MPs who met with a far-right German politician will stay in his caucus. Pierre Polyev previously condemned Christine Anderson's views, calling them racist and vile in a written statement, but he turned attention back onto the Prime Minister. Right now, what I'm more concerned about is the vile and racist views of the Prime Minister. You should be asking him, how many times did he dress up in these costumes? Yeah, how many other times? Mr. How many other times are there that we don't know about? So is this political messaging effective? Let's bring back our panelists, Chantal, Andrew, and Althea. And uh, Althea, what do you make of uh, Pierre Polyev's response to this this week? Uh, it's typical Pierre Polyev. This is his, the way he normally operates. Um, I think there's two things happening. Uh, one, uh, he realizes that there is pressure from what he would call mainstream media um, to get a categorical uh, condemnation for these three MPs um, having met uh, with this very controversial politician. Um, so he issues a statement on their behalf. And then the other thing is the attack um, on the prime minister, like him turning the tables. I, this is something we see in question period all the time. But I think it's part of a greater strategy, which is frankly voter suppression, turning people off politics completely so they get disgusted. So people decide, you know, it's not worth listening to politics. I'm not going to bother to vote. Uh, this is a tried and true tactic. And frankly, it works. So, I mean, that's a really interesting analytical point, but you actually believe that that is part of the strategy here, just to turn people off from politics? Absolutely. I have a bit of a different take on it, uh, and it's, it's not specific to this particular issue, but uh, I've been watching since uh, Mr. Poiliev decided to give more news conferences, I've been watching them, uh, and he's not very good at them. Uh, that is, he, he, he can only play offense, and he's very poor at playing defense. And what I'm curious to see uh, is his reply this week, or his, try, uh, his attempt to throw it back to Justin Trudeau. Canadians have had two elections to cast their judgment on the events that he refers to. Uh, it's kind of dated, but it saves him from trying to to actually articulate a, a solid defense of his stance vis-a-vis -vis those MPs. But I, I looked at that and I wondered, how does someone who, who responds like that get through a 40-day election campaign and two or three leaders' debates? Because you will not, in an election campaign, be able to play offense every single day and every single scrum. And if you can't defend your positions, articulate a defense you will eventually wear out your welcome on voters. Andrew, I'm curious, as you watched that news conference, the questions, you know, legitimate questions about his three MPs uh, with his answers deflecting to yeah. Trudeau's uh, conduct, uh, w what did you think? Well, I mean, the good news is he didn't actually say, yeah, I'm glad she, they met with her, she's a hero of mine, uh, which is, you know, in the leadership race, he might well have done when he was, you know, bringing coffee out to the convoy people. Uh, but he now realizes he's, he's got to at least nod in the direction of the mainstream voter. Uh, we saw in that by-election that, that they still have a lot of work to do to reach suburban voters in central Canada. Uh, so he's kind of stuck in between there where he doesn't want to uh, annoy the base, annoy the people who elected him leader. Uh, but he doesn't want to completely go all in on that. And so you, as Chantel said, he's not very good under fire. Uh, he's good on the attack, not so good on the defense. The, the, yeah, what about what you guys did may work tolerably well in Parliament where everyone kind of discounts it all as being part of the game. It's a little harder when you're, when you're out in the public eye. He's uh, uh, issued that statement, uh, on, you know, through a, through a series of tweets, basically, uh, denouncing them and uh, we had this leaked story that he read them the riot act in caucus behind closed doors in caucus but out in public he hasn't been willing to go to the, the further step uh, of actually saying I, I, I disown this I denounce this 
um, and it's going to hurt him. That, that's, that kind of thing is going to get replayed against him during the campaign. There's, a, you know, a news conference, uh, even when you're playing defense, is part, uh, in part a seduction exercise. You're not <laughs> playing to the journalists who are pushing you with questions. You're playing to that larger audience, and you want people who are not on your team to say, well, this guy looked solid. Yeah. Uh, and that's not what those news conferences and the tone of them, whenever uh, the tables are turned and it's not about uh, please attack Justin Trudeau so we can write it down. Uh, the, 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 the seduction aspect is not only lost, it becomes a repulsion uh, exercise. Althea, we have just a minute. Two things. One, I just want to go back to this idea that Pierre Poilievre read them the Riot Act. He told them, all caucus, that they should be careful who they meet with and they should screen the people that they meet with. But nobody in the Conservative caucus believes that Dean Allison and Colin Carey and Leslie Lewis did not actually know who they were meeting yeah. with. And if you really want to send a message, you punish people. You know, Leslie Lewis sits on the front bench of the Conservative in the House of Commons. If Mr. Poiliev wanted to say your behavior was not appropriate, I don't. I don't agree with this. He would have booted her to the back benches. Yep. He did not make any punishment, levy any punishment against these MPs. That's right. Um, the second thing, you know, I would love to believe that Chantal and Andrew are right, that the public will not like this. But I think we have to think also about the reporters in these press conferences. This campaign lasts for 40 days. When Mr. Poitiev doesn't like the question, he goes full on on the attack, personal or not, against what the issue that you're talking about or the reporter asking the question. And that gets really grating. Like, we don't want to actually fight with the members of parliament. We just want to ask them legitimate questions and get answers. And I, I don't know that that is something that the public will necessarily see because they're watching all these press conferences. They'll get snippets, and, and that snippet will be the message track that Mr. Poiliev wants to deliver. Yeah, but again, you yeah, know... But not you, in you a can, leader's debate. You, yeah. can't, you can't play a, that game for that's two true. hours. But in the press conferences, you can. But even then, you, can, you, can only con you can't really convert your inability to answer questions into the media are all against me. You can do that with your base because they'll believe that till the end of time but you can't do it with the, vo the voters who aren't, or aren't already committed to you. You just look weak. I have to say, it's fantastic <laughs> watching you guys. It's a lot of fun filling in for one week for Rosie and actually doing this, and thanks to all of you, but we're at uh, full time. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Let's head back to Adrian now in Toronto. Good job, thanks, Ian. Coming up, born in a snowy field, the calf is on the ropes right from the start. She was bound and determined that this calf was gonna make it. The moment a New Brunswick family saved him. Next. $31 million jackpot winner, Marie McCarthy. There she is, Nova Scotia's Marie McCarthy won a whopping $31 million. Can you imagine it? The biggest lottery prize in the province's history, and she didn't even buy the ticket. Well, my birthday was the 31st of January, Tuesday, and my grandson bought me tree tickets, and my other niece bought me one. Somebody bought her a ticket. That's excellent. McCarthy said at first it didn't feel real, probably won't, until she sees it in her bank account, at which point she says she plans to buy herself a vintage Cadillac. So this little one, you're looking at eight-year-old Daisy Kirkpatrick with a newborn calf that they decided to name Will. The calf earned that name because he had the will to live after being born in a snowy field in some pretty rough conditions. So as you saw in that picture, Daisy and her family brought the calf into their own home, warming him next to the wood stove, and that exceptional warmth is our moment. We did everything we could for it, and as the farmer, that's what we're supposed to do. It's calving season for us here at our farm. So I noticed down uh, there was a little calf born there. He was in the snow, which he melted through, and he just wasn't in a safe spot. The cast temperature was low, you could tell. It just no energy, uh, weak, had bad-looking eyes. We were going to take it over to the wood stove and do what we came with it there. And my little girl stayed right with the little fellow the whole time, and she was petting him on his head and stimulating him to get him going and excited. And in four hours, this calf went from, we are not even sure if this little guy is going to make it, to... Uh, this little eight-year-old girl give this calf so much of her attention and love and support that she she was bound and determined that this calf was going to make it. Her goal someday is to be a veterinarian. 
she's on the right path to having the big heart. And that's the first thing that you got to have as the farmer for these little calves is this guy's got the will to want to live and keep on going. So we named him Will. The little guy's with his mother now, and he's he's just out kicking his heels around with all his half-brothers and sisters and having a great day. Uh, Daisy, good for you. Uh, they were worried a little bit that, that the mother w wouldn't accept the calf. Uh, that happens sometimes, but, I mean, clearly it worked. That is The National for March the 9th. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.